<clears throat> Let's go. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here at ITDP UPM and thanks to the people that are following this session from their places, houses, offices, and so on. Uh, my name is Carlos Mataix. I am an associate professor at this university, Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, and I am also the director of uh, ITD UPM. Uh, for me, uh, for my uh, center, it's a honor, I would say, and a real pleasure uh, to host the presentation of a new book, a new creator. <laughs> very, very, very important. Uh, uh, I, I, I want to say, and, and it's also a pleasure to do it with the collaboration of other two institutions, uh, Partnership Brokers Association and uh, the Institute for Leadership and Sustainability uh, of the uh, University of Cambria in, in England. So uh, together and connected by Lida Stott, uh, the author of this book, we are here today to, to share more or less one hour, one hour and a half, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the reflections and the learnings, the, the insights that uh, this, this book is, is offering to all of us as a result of a long and, uh, yeah, and a very, very unique uh, career of uh, Lida Stott. She, she is uh, associate research at the center. She also collaborates with Partnership Brokers Association. I want to say that I had the opportunity to attend the course some years ago in London, um, very, very special about how to, to partner uh, organizations and, and people. And uh, also she, she collaborates with the Cambria University as a researcher as a, and as a, a, a teacher in, in different master and, and PhD um, courses. Uh, here in the, in the room, we have people that are following the master on strategy and uh, technology for development. And uh, they are also, students that had the opportunity to know uh, Lida because she is every year she, she gives a, a, a lesson about uh, partnerships and well I, I also want to, to share with you you all that uh, I met uh, Lida Stott uh, in 2008. No I think before. Before six, four. <laughs> I think it was six or seven. Six or seven in a in a meeting uh, in a series of, of meetings about uh, uh, partnerships um, uh, hosted by the Fundación Carolina and Carolina in Spain and in that time talking about partnerships was something very strange was not very welcome from the side of the NGOs they say what is this working with a business what is this that you no no everyone has to be in uh, its silo and uh, but um, uh, we recognize, I think we recognize uh, ourselves as people that were convinced that the collaborations, the partnerships, uh, the, the cooperation uh, was needed uh, a new way of uh, um, forging and, and clustering the projects, people, and organizations that had, at the end of the day, the, the same aim to the transformation. The, the title of, the, of this book is uh, something that I, I think is, is enough for sharing one hour, one day, one, one year. I, I, I love the, 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 this idea, the promise, the promise of multi-stakeholder collaboration in, in context. Of course, partnership and transformation is something that, that is uh, crucial in the SDG, SDG agenda, in the Green Deal agenda. But we are, I, I, I guess we are going to talk today if this is um, a promise of this is more and more the new way 
of behaving, the new way of achieving the, the uh, transformations that are so urgent uh, and so difficult to, to, to get. So uh, the, the, the session uh, is going to have uh, three, three parts. First part, um, we are going to introduce this uh, and, to, and to frame this, this book. And then I, I will uh, give the floor to, to David Murphy, who is the responsible for the series the ser the ser of books, uh, Citizenship and sustainability, sustainability in Organizations. And he will help us to, 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 to frame the, this, this important work. Then uh, uh, Lida Stott uh, will uh, have uh, 30 minutes to, to introduce us in this, in this work, in her work. Uh, and in the third part of the session, we will have um, a dialogue, an unlikely dialogue. First of all, Balbi, uh, that is, I will introduce uh, her later, and, the, uh, and again, uh, David will have the, the floor to, to have the first reaction to Lida's presentation, and then uh, here in the in the room and, uh, and the people that are people that are following us from from outside will have the, the the possibility to to be involved in the in the conversation. So, yeah. uh, okay, um, then uh, um, David um, David uh, Murphy, he's an associate professor in the. Uh, sorry, uh, sustainable sustainability and leadership uh, program at the University of Cambria. He also has responsibility in a doctoral program in that university and has a very uh, long record in collaborations, in working uh, with uh, um, partnerships and, and so on. And he, uh, as I mentioned, is the responsible for this uh, uh, series of, of books. And I want to 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 pass you the the, the word, uh, David, for you to to help us to understand why we are here. The microphone, the microphone I think. You, yeah, okay, muted. you're muted. Sorry. Okay. Uh, um, thank you, Carlos, and uh, lovely to see Lida, someone who I've known since 2005. I think was we met in Bratislava with Roz Tennyson. And it was a, a, an interesting uh, engagement with uh, private sector partnership, I think they were called, or partnership officers for UN development program in Eastern and Central Europe. So I've known Lita for almost 20 years and uh, someone that I've worked very closely with on uh, work with the partnering initiative and uh, with the UN system and uh, more recently with ITD UPM, IFLAS and our respective institutions that we're affiliated with. The uh, book series is uh, a Rutledge book series, the publisher Rutledge, which is part of the Taylor and Francis group. And uh, the, the roots of this uh, book series are with Greenleaf Publishing out of Sheffield and Leeds and Bradford in the UK and the Journal of Corporate Citizenship. And so this was the the forerunner really of the book series. And when Greenleaf Publishing was taken over by uh, Rutledge, Taylor and Francis back in 2018, um, the decision was taken to uh, transform the Journal of Corporate Citizenship into a book series. And it was renamed Citizenship and Sustainability in Organizations. And I think that was an important shift uh, dropping the word corporate, recognizing uh, that issues of citizenship and sustainability really uh, apply across all organizations around the world of all different types. So a much more inclusive way of looking at the idea of citizenship and sustainability in, in, in wider organizational context. Um, so I, I was appointed as the uh, the series editor, along with a colleague of mine, Professor Alison Marshall at the University of Cumbria. And uh, we launched the series in 2020. And uh, I'll just, I don't know whether I have the provision here to share the screen, but I'd just like to show people, and I'll share this link to the people who are online, but I'll just show you briefly the, um, I don't think I'm able to do this. Let me just see. 
Yes, not seeing it come up here. Um, okay, so let me just see why I'm not getting the. Um, no, I'm not seeing it. Uh, now. Are you able to see the uh, this? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, so this is the the home page, but I just wanted to show it to you briefly so that you could have a look at it. And since 2020, there have been seven books published. Uh, and you get a, a, a sense for the range of themes, uh, starting with the intelligent nation, how to organize a country. So taking some of these ideas to a nation state level by John Beckford, other contributions by um, a group of academics from Latin America, knowledge management and sustainability, a human centered perspective on research and practice, corporate citizenship and family business, and really the first book was Citizenship and Sustainability in Organizations, uh, Exploring and Spanning the Boundaries, which was a link between the, the journal, uh, bringing contributions from the journal into the book series by uh, inviting authors uh, to update articles that they had written over the last 10, 15 years, bringing it into the current context. Uh, the most recent books are Lita's book and uh, a book uh, on um, business schools and uh, the future of responsible management education, looking at the SDGs. And then uh, the upcoming title is, is from um, on smart organizations in the public sector coming up uh, later this year. So uh, just to say that we would welcome proposals from academics and practitioners out there who are working in that broad field of sustainability and citizenship in organizations and uh, please follow up with me if you have some ideas or suggestions of, of uh, book proposals that you would like to make. We certainly welcome them. Okay, I'll hand you back to, uh, to Carlos and Linda there. Thank you. Thank you, baby. Thank you, man. Many, many of us are taking note of uh, these uh, titles because it, it cannot be more suggesting uh, especially for those who are involved in uh, sustainable development, as many people in the in the room. So, uh, Lida, uh, um, it's clear that uh, above all, uh, I consider Lida a friend. Uh, this center uh, exists because we had uh, several sources of inspiration more than ten years ago, and one of the most uh, 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 important was uh, leaders ideas leaders com conversation we had the opportunity to to have with with her and for that time she has been an associate uh, researcher of this center we have been participating in different projects together um, the first uh, 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 project we international project we had in this uh, center was with the Inter, uh, Inter American Development Bank and that project was uh, led by, by Lida. Uh, she has a very, very uh, uh, long and I would say intense career working in, in NGOs like International Amnesty, uh, uh, working in uh, academia, uh, in consultant. Now she's working for the European Commission sp specifically in partnerships. And uh, she's a person that creates uh, context, a good context for doing things, the kind of things that we, and for me, it's not strange to, to I had not the opportunity to read this book. It's very fresh, it's, uh, but I had the opportunity to, to, to have a look to the introduction of uh, the, um, this um, uh, importance that you give to the personal dimension, to the relational dimension that has to be balanced with the technical and pragmatical uh, dimension um, is, uh, is something that doesn't strange to me. But uh, I am sure that your, um, your overview your uh, insight uh, is going to to give all, all of of us practitioners and researchers in this field uh, a very important clues on how to improve in this uh, way that uh, never stops. We are always uh, learning and 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 learning. And the last uh, thing I, I want to say is that idea of the the context dependence on context uh, uh, importance 
that you have to take into account when you are dealing with partnerships. It's not the, the same to work here in Spain. We have talked many times about this. England is England, Spain is Spain, Balbi is in, in India, and the, the, there are many uh, place uh, dimensions or place-based uh, dimensions that uh, uh, that uh, uh, um, we have to take into account if we want to to work in in partnerships. Lida, um, it's your turn uh, mm -hmm. and feel comfortable. We have uh, uh, half an hour. Half an hour. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you very much, Carlos, for the introduction. And thank you to you all for being here. I recognize many familiar faces. I'm grateful to you, Carlos, and the ITD UPM because you've been very important in my work on partnership. And I'm also super grateful to Bulbul from the Partnership Brokers Association and to David from the Institute for Leadership and Sustainability at the University of Cumbria. Without you, this book probably wouldn't have been written. That might sound like a cliche, but it's true, <laughs> okay. So I wanted to give a little bit of background, first of all, on why I wrote the book. Um, I've spent years, perhaps too many, working in partnership and collaboration. I began in the mid-1990s, uh, working mainly with the private sector and looking at how they worked with other sectors. And then I became interested in looking at how others, organizations from the NGO, civil society, and government and public sector um, spheres joined with them. So... Because of this kind of crazy world of different collaborative experiences, I was keen around 2010 to draw these ideas together that had been coming from all these uh, various experiences, which seemed hugely diverse because in all the different contexts I've worked with, partnership and collaboration are viewed differently. We don't all have a common vision of what partnership is or should be. And I kind of wanted to make sense of that. I'm a practitioner, I come from practice, but I love academia. I love reading, I love ideas, I love working with university students. So I wanted to draw the practice and the academic writing and research together. And a book seemed a perfect way to do it. I did a PhD on the way, and this kind of opened the door to the idea maybe of doing something more personal because within a PhD, okay, it's your ideas and it's quite academic, but I wanted to do broaden out and bring in more practitioner dimensions as well. So just a little bit on the studies I used for the book. Most of them are drawn from these three experiences. Carlos has mentioned one of them, which I did with ITD UPM. But the first was between 2003 and 2005. And it was looking at um, some partnerships in Zambia and in South Africa. And we chose three in each country, one that was uh, looking at HIV, HIV AIDS in the field of health, one was looking at small scale farming in the field of agriculture, and one at access to education. Okay, so these were one set of studies that had quite unusual ways of looking at partnership. In Southern Africa, there was no definition of partnership. People said, we work together. So this got me thinking, that's unusual, that's not how I see partnership. The next is work that I've done with the European Union. I've worked with them since the early 2000s. And the work I've done is mainly with the European Social Fund. And we have looked at different experiences of working in partnership to access employment and promote social inclusion in the different member states. So through peer reviews, through case studies, et cetera. And we've tried to bring some of those different viewpoints on partnership together, bearing in mind those very different European context. And finally, as Carlos has mentioned, this study we did here at uh, ITD UPM with the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, where we looked at five studies. We looked at four in Latin America, in Guatemala on health, in Peru, two studies on access to energy and uh, managing waste, and a fourth one in Guatemala on e-health solutions to um, uh, deal with problematic maternal health uh, mortality rates in a province in Guatemala. And we contrasted them with a study in South Africa to give a fresh viewpoint. Again, the emphasis on context was crucial to this. So 
I used these studies and what I did for my PhD, I used the first two and I looked at partnership in relation to what I called social progress. I, I come from a social background. I'm interested in social interactions and I chose to focus on that in the PhD. But what struck me afterwards is there is a huge interest in transformation. Uh, Carlos has mentioned that in relation to the sustainable development goals, we're talking a lot about how we can transform society and what we need to do in, able, in order to meet the challenges that sustainable development implies. So I decided to move away simply from social progress and try and open it a little bit, not looking at the sustainable development goals per se, but the idea of sustainability and beyond the goals, if I might say. And then, as you've mentioned, Carlos, another of the areas I wanted to look at was this attention to personal relationships. I have here one of my ex-students, Paloma, who put this idea into my head, Paloma, years ago. For that, you're very much acknowledged in the book. You're from a, psycho a psychology background. And I remember a discussion we had years ago about how people fit into this. And I think that really set me going, thinking more and more about the personal and relational aspects. And David and I have really worked in recent years on examining that more in more detail. Okay, so the first part of the book is really how do we understand partnership? What is partnership? What does it mean? I don't give a definition because I don't think it's possible because in all the contexts that I work in, people will have different definitions. Uh, when I first started working in partnership, I saw partnership as a kind of entity, a structure, a construct. Organizations come together, they have a governance mechanism or, a, or they kind of uh, join in a construct which is kind of manageable and um, it has a way of working to achieve goals. So this was my view of partnership. But through the work I did in South Africa and Zambia with a kind of beginning, this idea of working together, how do the different partners work together? In Europe, they don't even uh, define partnership as a construct. They see it as a way of working together. They have a partnership principle, which is about how we build relations across different sectors of society. So I began to acknowledge that we needed to incorporate, as well as a structure, a view of partnership as a process, a way of working. And then increasingly, and I can draw on the Latin American studies, as well as the ones from Southern Africa, particularly, this idea of values entering. So solidarity, respect, reciprocity, mutual benefit seem to be very strong threads in the different partnership arrangements that were being developed in these cases. So from there, I started thinking, OK, so on one level, we can see partnership as an instrument. You know, it's a kind of means to an end, a vehicle by which to achieve results, which is fine, all well and good. But we must also see it's something intrinsic. It's something that's about human relations, and it may precede these kind of structural uh, understandings that we have of partnership. In fact, lots of studies in biology and sociology suggest that partnership is innate to us. It's part and parcel of who we are. And um, so the idea of values has become more and more important in the work I do in partnership. And I believe that's about an intrinsic understanding of partnership, which may, and this kind of causes difficulties with people who see it as a means to an end, maybe collaboration is about an end in itself improving the way we work together as human beings, okay? Then what interested me was to say, well, why do we give so much emphasis to an instrumental view of partnership? Because in the areas I work in, when we talk about partnership, the structural understanding seems to predominate. So when I looked at this historically, I began to see that if partnership has always existed and humans have always collaborated and it's in our genes, something kind of changed with this new kind of partnership is like the buzzword in development, et cetera, in the 1980s. Well, what does that coincide with? It, coinci it coincides with globalization and changes in the role of different sectors of society. I'd say specifically the shrinking of the public sphere, the kind of rolling back of the state, if you like, and a greater emphasis on the role that the private sector and civil society can play in governance, okay? That can be positive and negative. 
And I think that one of my concerns was looking at this was that views such relating specifically to the private sector around things like the private sector uh, has a role to play in development projects through things like corporate social responsibility, et cetera, and should be sitting at the table, but also and kind of more problematically that the public sector should be perhaps run like a business and the concept of new public management. And they both kind of came out towards the end of the 80s. They seem to position a narrative that is centered on partnership as an instrument. And it privileges, I think, to a great extent, the role of the private sector. Sector. Now, I am not against working with the private sector, and I want to make that absolutely clear. My concern is that an instrumental vision of partnership privileges the role of the private sector when it's just one among a whole range of possible partners. And if the idea of partnership is about horizontality and equity, then it should be just another player. And sure, it should be at the table. But also, it's been um, because of this instrumental view, we've been able to criticize criticize partnership, particularly from civil society perspectives by saying, oh, it's all about partnerships with the private sector, the private sector's dominating our lives, look, they're greenwashing, they're bluewashing, etc., which is also a sterile and not very fruitful discourse for something that we're trying to build on that is much deeper than that. So I wanted to shear away from that. And so my argument in the first chapter is let's recover or reposition those relational process and value type visions of partnership into um, a, a wider and broader vision. Let's bring them back into the discourse on collaboration so that we refresh and, and improve it, I hope. I've took, the book is about context, and I'm obsessed with context because I really believe we cannot understand partnership uh, if it's not related to the specific and changing, might I add, because partnerships are dynamic context that we're working in. So my students will recognize the diagram at the end because I often talk about the external context that Carlos has mentioned, the institutional norms uh, that are in place in different countries, the particular cultural, uh, historical, social, political environments, et cetera. Yeah, this can either push or pull people to partnership and is very important always to acknowledge. But we also have to acknowledge other contexts organizational context. If partnerships are about if different organizations and collectives coming together, then we need to look at that level too, because they have their own specific contexts, cultures, ways of behavior that have to be brought into an understanding of what we're talking about. And then last but not least, and this is a result of my work with, with David particularly, but also drawing on all these views of the individual, the importance of the individual or this micro level, it is individuals that represent organizations that are involved in partnership. So we need to recognize the role they play. What are their pushes and pulls? What are their incentives or non-incentives um, in, in being involved or not involved in collaborations? And then in work that I'd done with David, I began to think, well, this is all very well, but it's overlaid, if we go back to instrumental and intrinsic, by some other drivers. And these are, and David and I, in an article that we wrote in 2020, talked about, and it may sound a little bit academic, because we took this from second language learning, but the idea of incentives that uh, encourage organizations, people, et cetera, to work in partnership as being instrumental and extrinsic. So you'll get rewards if you do this. We have a focus on results. It's partnership as um, a means to an end. And I've called these pragmatic drivers, okay? And then we have on the other side, what David and I called intrinsic and integrative drivers, which were mu are much more about bringing together transversal ideas, emphasizing attention to process. And I've called these reflective drivers. So they're about, these nexus approaches, more experimentation learning. So the more intrinsic side. And I think that all these contextual levels are overlain by a kind of 
almost sometimes a search for balance between these two. I believe our emphasis has been on the pragmatic and I'm anxious for the reflective drivers to be brought in more deeply, but I do not say that we don't need pragmatic drivers. We do, they are important. The problem is we need to get a better balance between those drivers and the reflective ones. So my next step was then to look at this in relation to transformation. I don't know about the rest of you, but I've had huge headaches with the concept of transformation. What on earth does it mean? Why are we using it? It's a bit like partnership. We kind of, it can, anything can kind of fit under the concept of partnership. So I look in this chapter on, on transformation at what does it really mean? I've come to uh, the idea that it's about systemic change. So it's about changes, fundamental changes, deep changes in structures, in our values, in processes, in behaviors, rules and norms, et cetera. And that it can take place at individual, organizational, or societal level. And a lot of the transformational potential that I saw in the partnerships that I've worked with are when those three levels combine, there are changes at those three levels. And so I've added to this, this idea of combining the pragmatic and reflective as well, and focused very much on that. What I've done um, using different examples, of course, the book is full of examples. I can't go into all of them. It wouldn't be fair to prioritize one over another, but there are many of them from those case studies in the book. And what I've tried to do as well, again, I don't know if those of you who work in, co in collaboration and partnership have had the same problem, but there has been kind of huge um, interest in how do we monitor and evaluate these things? Do we monitor the results? Do we monitor the relationships? Do we monitor the process? And this has driven me mad for years because I've never been able to find a kind of perfect recipe. I think it depends on context. So in a way, in the book, in this chapter, what I did was like I throwing it all away. Partners can choose how they want to monitor and evaluate. They can do it themselves. They can come up with their own ways of doing this. What may be interesting is to look at what is their potential for transformation to explore that. And I've come up adapting uh, practitioner frameworks that talk about uh, partnerships that are transactional and transformational and the spectrum that that involves. And um, from the collaborative value creation spectrum by um, James Austin and May Satanidi that we have used a lot in our work in ITD UPM. I've um, looked at different partnership arrangements and I tried to simplify them a little bit so that they're fit for practitioners to use and come up with tactical, targeted, transversal and transformational partnership and what they might involve. The idea being that the first ones are much more pragmatic, focus-based, means to an end, quick, sharp, time-bound, and the more transversal and transformational are, are keen to integrate more reflective dimensions with transform transformational, really balancing the two well, but giving really thoughtful care uh, and careful attention to relational connections. Okay. Part of that and this idea of transformation and partnership, I think, is around participation. And I was keen to explore stakeholders. We use stakeholders. It may be I've been accused. Somebody once said that's a very business like term uh, if, if you're trying to get away from that. But I've used the term stakeholders to describe the different audiences and publics that might be involved in partnership. And I wanted to look at the their connection to partnership in relation to power, because it strikes me that some, for example, a donor or international agency has a very different kind of power in a partnership to say a community organization or a small NGO, which might have um, a different way of, of connecting. And this is about power. So I try and look at that and, and plot some possibilities for exploring or mapping stakeholders in partnership. And then through studies like the one on e-health in rural areas in Guatemala, I suggest that we might draw on place-based linkages. Many of these are things that have been in place traditionally. In the Guatemalan case, there was great um, respect towards Mayan culture in this uh, project that was adopted to reduce uh, mater maternal mortality rates in rural areas of Guatemala by um, working in the local language, by using traditions that local people would expect, uh, would, would anticipate or use in their traditional uh, 
um, ways of life, but I did not, and I think this is really important because in Africa this happens a lot, we are not deifying or kind of saying that a pre-colonial traditions or traditional ways or localisms are marvelous and the answer to everything. I don't believe that. I think that what these studies show is you can draw on good and positive things that are traditionally in place in society, but they need being brought up to date. So in the uh, Guatemalan case, we had young women being given a very, very important role in this project, in the program that has um, developed and links were made also to the public sector to the extent that today the program that began with the use of mobile phones in rural areas using local languages and young women etc is now part and parcel of the health service in the region in which it was developed and is being used in other parts of Guatemala and the uh, decline in mortality rates for women giving birth has been noticeable and there is evidence for that scientific evidence so the idea there was to look at the possibility of where to place base um, relationships that link to the policy level or micro where they can really transform. And I think within that there is a role to be played and here I bring in the work that Bulbul has done and of the Partnership Brokers Association of this intermediary role whereby um, it's a function that can be undertaken by individuals or organizations both within and outside of a partnership that are able to kind of uh, create the glue that enhances these contextual linkages I'm talking about, that reinforces inclusion. And Bulbul has done a lot of work on this, creates, and I think you beautifully call it brave space. And I mentioned this in the book, rather than safe space, brave spaces where different points of view can be brought together and organizations and individuals can share uh, often um, discordant points of view or opinions uh, in a way that allows for what we would call productive conflict. So conflict is not necessarily a negative thing. It's a way of expressing different points of view that allow us to achieve new understandings and ways of working so that we're able to transform and move on. Um, last slide. Very quickly, two other themes in the last two chapters. I tried, and this, this is, was kind of new for me, so I learned a lot doing it, and I'm not an expert by any means on either of the themes, but one was where does partnership sit in the current collaborative context? So what other forms of collaboration are out there? Itereupe does a lot of work in collaborative ecosystems, in platforms, networks, hubs, clusters, etc. Where does partnership sit within this wealth of new and emerging paradigms and how far what are the core elements of some of these with examples and how far are they transformational so looking a little bit at, are they changing parts of systems or systems how are they using this idea of partnership brokering is it in a very um traditional facilitationary way or is it something um deeper and um i so i look at those elements and then also in the final chapter, as David has said, this book um, sits within a series on sustainability and citizenship in organizations. So I tried as best I could to look at the literature and some of the experiences that I was familiar with um, related to these concepts, bringing in partnership. So I chose to look at the pragmatic and relational uh, views of these three concepts, and I brought them together under the umbrella of what I call global citizenship, which okay, might sound very ambitious, but it's a kind of duty to care, stewardship for the planet. And um, I looked at ways that this might be made possible by linking these three concepts together. And I wanted to end with uh, a wonderful quote that I found by Martha Nussbaum, the, the American uh, philosopher who's worked a lot on human rights. But I think this, for me, is very, very crucial to partnership and to this understanding of global citizenship. And it's this idea that we're not, I'm, we, to become citizens of the world, we step away from the comfort of assured truths, from nestling in the feeling of being surrounded by people who share our convictions and passions. That happens when we work in partnership. There's something very wonderful about that. But partnership is ultimately, for me, and very importantly, about working with the other. 
about acknowledging and working with diversity, sometimes with organizations or individuals that we might never normally consider to be natural partners. And unless we take this on, I doubt very much whether the future of the world is going to be in safe hands. So I'll end there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for the inspiration. Thank you for your clarity. It is so difficult to, to, to talk with a so clear uh, and the understanding of, of these complex issues, uh, Lida. And, and thank you for, for sharing uh, um, your, your thoughts and your experience. Uh, um, uh, we have uh, like uh, 20, 25 minutes uh, yet. Okay, and 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 yeah. and we are going to take a, to to take advantage of, of of this time because we see that there are many comments and uh, questions in the chat. But uh, before giving the floor to to the uh, people that is with us today, uh, I I wanted to. Uh, give the floor to to uh, sorry bulbul baxi bulbul sorry because I, I am pronouncing very uh, <laughs> horrible <laughs> That's okay. her, her name uh, she, uh, she, she is following us from india uh, she has, uh, uh, is a practitioner working in a very different environment to this environment here in europe in in uh, in madrid and she uh, is also a committed uh, um, partnership um, practitioner. Uh, uh, she she, built, she uh, collaborates with the Partner in Broken In Association. And uh, I wanted to ask uh, Jugolvi to, to share with us your, your reflections uh, after the leader's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, so I'm here speaking on behalf of the Partnership Brokers Association and Lida is an associate and a very close colleague and friend. And uh, it's my privilege to speak about uh, Lida's very well written book, which has touched upon themes that I found resonance with as a practitioner. As Carlos said, I'm based in India. Uh, so Lida being uh, both a practitioner and an academic, though she calls herself a person with academic interest, but I think she's both. And she has created a bridge between research and practice in her book. And what I would try to do now is share my reflections on a couple of themes in the book based on our experience and practice at the Partnership Brokers Association. Uh, the first proposition of the book that Lida mentioned is partnering a means to an end or an end in itself. I think it's a very powerful one and one that demands that we reflect on it. Now, partnering is a principle-based approach. When we speak of values, they reflect a worldview, an approach, and so they cannot only be a means to an end. They define both the end and the means, and the focus on values and principles makes partnering a political rather than a managerial process. And that is my insight from our practice. Uh, to give a small example, I was conducting a workshop in India for male grassroots political leaders who were either elected representatives of a local self-government or they were the local kingmakers. The purpose of the workshop was to help them reflect on what collaborating with their female colleagues, the women leaders actually entail. And as you can imagine, there was not much collaboration actually happening. So there were older and younger men among the participants and the older ones raised the question, if we give up our power and dominance, shall we not make ourselves redundant? This led to a discussion on what it means to make way for new leadership, for diverse leaders, and how their role may evolve into being mentors and advisors. However, there's no smoothing over the fact that new leadership will necessarily challenge the old one. And the system has low tolerance for challenges. 
these men comply with those above them in the pecking order and expect the same from those below. At this point, I presented the partnering principles that we at Partnership Brokers Association aspire towards are guided by. And one of the principles is courage that helps to meet the challenge of uncertainty. I mean, anything that is, uh, involves change also involves uncertainty. And one of them said, yes, this is what we need to give up power. We need courage to collaborate. It seems that till date, and David mentioned this the other day, partnering is considered more of a management discipline than a social science discipline. And uh, this is probably reflected in the mainstream discourse, including perhaps the way it is formulated in SDG Goal 17. And uh, I welcome leaders' challenge to this notion of instrumentality. Embracing partnering as an approach and as a political process is both conceptually and in practice closely linked to its potential to bring about change. Leader has tried to demystify the term for transformation very timely. An assumption that we work on is that any significant change entails a change in the status quo. So the process will shake up vested interests. I don't use the term vested interest necessarily in an ominous sense. I think we are fantastically, we are often fantastically unaware of the privileges that we enjoy in a given system. With the best of intentions, we are unaware of that. So a change process cannot be a very elegant and an amorous one. It will be a messy one. Nitsen, the psychoanalyst who works with groups, says that excessive group cohesion and apparent absence of group oppositional forces represent a resistance to change. Uh, I think Lida refers to Ponsolet, who on similar lines have said that partnerships are often seen to accommodate different interests. And by accommodating interests, they sabotage radical change. So what does a well-functioning and effective partnership mean? It doesn't mean harmony all the way for sure. And uh, this brings us to the role of partnership brokers that uh, Lida alludes to. In our experience, all partnerships are not set up with the intent of bringing about transformative changes, you know, the difference of doing better and doing differently. Sometimes a partnership formed to just execute a project or undertake a set of activities may evolve into something more ambitious. So something that started off as being tactical may actually become transformative, provided in our experience, the arrangement is principle-based. It's based on principles such as equity, diversity, co-creation, collaborative problem solving, mutual benefit and accountability. Such arrangements are usually seen to be pushing boundaries, even if the immediate purpose is not transformation. So partnership brokering is a discipline that we are growing, whatever it may ultimately be called, leader has presented a whole topology. Now we were discussing among our associates at the Partnership Brokers Association, that external partnership brokers like leader, like me, like many of us here, are probably more of change enablers. And the internal partnership brokers, that is who are internal to a partner organization and a partnership, maybe they're more of change makers. And the change enablers and change makers probably need to work in collaboration with each other. Now, both being associated with change will have to hold space and help partners navigate difficult conversations, conflict, discord, and I think quite appropriately leader flags this as a significant part of the partnering process and of partnership brokering role. And this needs more exploration, probably in the next book that leader writes or David uh, edits. So productive conflict, for instance, what does it mean? I mean, a conflict is found to be productive in hindsight. When we hold space for discord and disagreements to emerge, when does it become a conflict? 
Probably, as Andrew Ackland said in his describing the uncertainty cycle, that when emotions start getting involved, we start uh, making projections, we start projecting aggression, malified intent, it becomes more than just a difference and disagreement. Very often, the person or persons playing a partnership brokering role find themselves on the line. I have I have had experience when partners maintained an apparent cohesion within the meeting space and directed their angst against the partnership broker, the external enemy. Then again, when we were training in Istanbul with a group of practitioners who are mainly from the Middle East, the room froze when I mentioned conflict because it means something very different to them. So I think this is something that needs uh, this merits uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, attention and de-layering, perhaps. Finally, what is radical today may, be, may become status quo tomorrow. The same applies to partnering. So while I agree that partnering being a principal process is a political one and not merely a means to an end, I hesitate to call it an end in itself. Traditional communities that have experienced collaboration quite deeply, and leader refers to it, have also entrenched past structures that are not equitable necessarily and not conducive to change. And wh what we are trying to talk about here is partnering and change. Uh, I would stop here. Congratulations. Bingo. Many, <laughs> many, many, many thanks for your contribution. Very. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I, wa I was thinking to ask for an applaud, but uh, it wasn't necessary. It was spontaneous uh, from from here, from from Madrid. Thank you, thank you very much, David. Uh, do, uh, the 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 floor is yours if uh, if you want to 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 keep this this conversation to follow this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Carlos. Um, I have three things that I just wanted to uh, to. I guess, uh, raise or uh, put on the floor in terms of my thinking that th three things that particularly caught my attention in the book. And I, I have questions here for Lida that I wanted to see if, if Lida might want to just engage in a conversation about this. I'll just start with this and I'm going to put them in the chat for the people who are online. And I'll just get the, the document up here so that I, I keep to script and don't, uh, don't go on too long because I know that we'll, we'll be running out of time shortly, but um, what I really appreciated about the book was this looking back at more than 30 years of partnership working in such a, a, a wide range of diverse contexts. And, and I really appreciated the, the combination of the practitioner literature with academic literature and also writers who we might not normally associate with partnership, uh, even though so much evidence to say that they would be important voices like Richard Sennett. And uh, I, I noticed uh, Naomi Klein was, was, was quoted and, and referenced in the book, uh, you know, a kind of popular activist, um, a different kind of perspective really on these issues, which I thought was really valuable. Um, so Lita, the, the question that I, the first question I have for you was, What's different about this book compared to that rich uh, array of references uh, and, and authors that you cite and that you, you really very effectively weave into your own narrative about partnership and its transformative potential? Um, that's the first part of the question. And the second one, I guess, is, is you know, not just what is different about the book, but then as a result of all that work that you've done and bringing those ideas together, why do you think partnerships are, are more urgent or are they more urgent now? Okay, I'll, I'll try, I'll try and answer very briefly. That's a big one. Um, the what's different about the book, I I my idea was really to bring in this instrumental and intrinsic understanding. And most of the literature, I think, uh, to my mind, particularly the academic literature, relates to the instrumental view of partnership. And I think I wanted to bring in and, and reading through those past references and the Naomi Klein's of this world, I began to see that there are kind of references to, to different kinds of understandings of partnership, particularly in relation to uh, intrinsic awareness about partnership. And I 
I wanted to bring that in. So maybe that's the difference. It's kind of drawing back from the past and wider writings, things that may uh, take the, the debates and the narrative on partnership further. If I could have done that, that would be great. I don't know if I can be so ambitious, but that was definitely part of my thinking. And then the second question that you've asked about why are partnerships more needed than ever? I just think collaboration is just more needed than ever because of the kind of world that we're living in. Apart from the, the what we've called wicked problems that we're facing, that no one, you know, it's the classic comment that people make, no one individual sector organization can address these problems um, alone. We need to cooperate with others. It's kind of cooperate or die, partnership or perish, I think we used to say. Say. but this would be the idea and I just think we've got to do it and we're not doing it very well and what I wanted to do was perhaps bring in some new factors that might galvanize the debate and encourage us to do it a little bit differently and refresh and that's why I see partnership as being important. Thanks Lida. I'll, I'll move on to the second point and, and this is uh, really the thing that you know that has increasingly um, got my attention, and I, I know that you're, you said the same thing, is this interpersonal uh, dimension of partnerships and collaboration. Um, and uh, I'm particularly interested in, in, in that you know, there wasn't, there didn't appear to be a lot of literature that addressed this, particularly in the academic literature historically. And yet I did come across something that James Austin said back in 2000 in his book, The Collaboration Challenge, which I thought was interesting because it's something that I hadn't, hadn't maybe I had noticed it before, but it certainly didn't catch, capture my attention the way this issue is now. And he talks about uh, the person relationships being the glue that binds the organizations together, which I think has echoes really of a lot of what you're saying in the book. And, and the, the interesting thing I'm also noticing is that in popular books, like the latest book by Michelle Obama called The Light We Carry, it has a chapter entitled Partnering Well <laughs> that shares her own reflections about her relationships with Barack, their daughters, and her extended family and friends. And it, it, it reads like a, a handbook or a tool book almost on partnerships and has echoes of a lot of the practitioner literature on partnerships that, that, you know, that we have used in our work. I think that's really fascinating too. And I'm noticing attention in, 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 again in, in, a, in a more popular format about relationships like The Good Life by Robert Waldinger and Mark Schultz on the, the Harvard study on, on happiness and the importance of relationships as a, as a, as a foundation for happiness in our lives. Um, so the question I have here is, is your book's renewed focus on the interpersonal dimensions of partnerships, do you think that's indicative of a shift in how we think about, understand, and make sense of partnerships in their broadest sense? Okay, I, I like the question. I'm almost inclined to throw it open to the audience and let them say what they think. Uh, I know what I think, but I'm very interested to hear what people in the audience or who are online yeah, might might. Good idea. Say about that i mean is i i feel that the importance of the individual and relational aspects are increasing increasingly crucial that to move again away from the instrumental is important but i'm very interested to hear what others think so, I, so we're going to start uh, uh, here in the in the room uh, andrea is uh, is um, uh, taking note of the suggestions and uh, questions in the in the chat Okay, so uh, the, this is, uh, uh, there are some rules when we talk here when we have a conversation, and uh, but th th there is uh, at, at the end one rule. This is a conversation, and we we want to 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 create a common thread on the the conversation. So uh, uh, Lida has uh, uh, sent the sent by the question to the to the audience. Someone uh, wants uh, to to share his or her reflection there we have a, a, a I will I will Rose is also there um and th there are three three uh, uh people the words in two in the room and Rose uh, online so we, we start here Teresa if, if you want yes. if you can introduce yourself 
very briefly. Thank you, Lida. My name is Teresa Sanchez. I'm a, also a researcher and a, I, I'm, I'm not a practitioner. <laughs> so I'm from academia. I'm, I was particularly interested in the way, in your clarity and in the way you really bridge the academic and the, and the practitioner's work. And I found all the discussion very inspiring. And, but uh, focusing on the topic of the individual versus the uh, instrumental view of partnerships, I was kind of thinking that, yes, the human being is uh, made to collaborate in a way, but I kind of feel that we have externalized collaboration. So it has passed from the individual, individual level to the system level. So now we don't really need to collaborate because we go to the supermarket and everything is there. So we have supply chain, so we don't need to collaborate like individually. So, and I'm actually borrowing some ideas from Irene Ezquerra, which is a, a researcher at ITD UPM. And she's researching uh, on collaboration and learning. And I was thinking, well, what if partnerships are the uh, kind of capacity building environments? And so in a, in a post apocalyptic uh, world, we need to collaborate like <laughs> you and me again. So maybe this is enough. And it's kind of both instrumental and kind of intrinsic. So for me, it's very instrumental to learn to collaborate again. It's like losing some, a capacity we used to have. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Manuel Ira. I'm a student of uh, this uh, master in, in you know, uh, strategies and technologies for development. And um, my studies, I mean, my, my work for, for ending and, and to reach the, the, the master is based on these uh, topics. So uh, my point of view on this one is, and I'm going back to fundamentals, which is individuals are, if I may, the atoms. And then when they glue each other and they collaborate, they will create something, right? So I believe that if we could try, as you were saying that it is quite a dream, right? I, I think that could be a reality uh, in the short term because we have the capacity and we are here collaborating and hearing and making ideas for the future meaning that these atoms will change in the future. So through education and through changes from the individual level, we will reach that new normal, if I may, in the future. But it's not gonna happen in the other way around, meaning that by forcing people, they need to know how to live in a different way and then they will see normal. So I believe that, if I may, that the partnership is important and the transformation too, I don't know if it's a partnership and transformation or, or the other way around. But in any case, I think that the individual is the one that will be creating this new way of doing things. And maybe we can move away from partnerships and you know collaboration and all these things because we will do it intensively as you know, eat or drink water or whatever that we know. And uh, I think that <clears throat> The, the things that we are experiencing and we have experienced as, a, as the pandemic, for example, have shown that there is something that we can do and we need to do something. So uh, basically, I think that individuals, they will glue and they will do something for the future and the new bodies. Name it as or phrases as, as you want, but I, I think that's the key. Okay. There are two more questions. I don't know if we can stop here. You can answer and then we pass the... the um, yeah, no, take, yeah. we can, we can. I, I take them all because if it's a conversation, I'd like others to kind of okay. and not just be. So I, I see we have three three hands. Uh, Ross Tennyson was the first. It's a pleasure to seeing you again, Rose. It's uh, okay. your turn. And then we have two, two more people. What do you want? Okay, thank you. I hope this does make a bridge to what David was bringing. And uh, Lida, it's wonderful to hear you speak so brilliantly about this topic and you're so knowledgeable and it's, it's marvellous. But I happen to have known you even longer than David, I think since about 1994, 95, something like that. And what I know is underneath this incredible academic practitioner, articulate speaker, there's a, an almost invisible activist longing to get out. And I'm really curious, and I don't know whether your book covers it because I haven't been able to look at your book yet, uh, what the what the interface is between what we might call activism or disruption and transformation. 
In other words, I'm quite nervous about transformation becoming a bit of a bland platitude. I'm not saying your book says that at all, but by making it so explicit, there is a risk that it becomes a bit too uh, neat. And what is the role of, to pick up David's point about individuals, you know, not just relationships between people, but the role of people who are actually going to challenge and ch really challenge and change and disrupt in order to bring, can we have transformation without disruption? I suppose is perhaps a better way of putting it. So it is a bit of a question for you, leader, but obviously I'm really happy to hear anybody else's responses. Many thanks. Uh, Valentina and Rosaline are there also with her hands on. Valentina, if you want. Yes, uh, hello everybody. I'm uh, Valentina Kaimi, work in Brussels, and uh, I had uh, the pleasure to work with uh, LIDA in the frame, framework of the ESF transitional platform. And I have a question. Uh, in, uh, in my work, in my daily work, uh, I'm uh, more and more confronted by this uh, contradiction uh, in the sense that uh, I see very often uh, institutions that from a policy perspective, they promote uh, the partnership model. But then when it comes to uh, the same institution um, playing the role of a donor, a funder, uh, often uh, they prefer uh, funding interventions by big uh, corporations uh, or uh, one big uh, association uh, instead of uh, the same intervention uh, proposed by a partnership of different organizations uh, with uh, the assumption that uh, um, whatever is delivered by one single big organization is uh, much more effective than what is delivered by a partnership, by different organizations working together. So uh, first of all, I would like to know if uh, you also experience this kind of uh, contradiction, tension, and what would be your arguments to, to try to, to really reaffirm again the added value of partnerships? Thank, Thank you, Valentina. Many, many people are resonating here, here <laughs> your, your words. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Jocelyn uh, and then Naila here, and we'll, we'll go back to, to uh, Lida. She's writing, so I'm, I'm confident <laughs> she, she will not forget anything. Jocelyn, right. what do you want? Great. Thanks so much. Good morning. I'm Jocelyn Don, based in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, and I've been doing partnerships for well over 40 years, first started actually in our national park system here in Canada when there was a recognition, I think, to that first one that they couldn't, you know, Parks Canada could not address alone all the challenges of the preservation and protection of these national spaces. So, um, you know, I just see the real value of it. But I, I did really love the way you pull out that interpersonal dimension, Lita, and nice to see you again. We met in... Um, just outside of outside of Amsterdam. But I always think that the big thing about partnerships is it's a group activity, but it is an individual effort. And when you look at that relational, and I look at the audience in the room and also online, the vast majority are women. And that is kind of our natural default to be very relational. How do we get more men involved in this? And, and I'm a trainer with the partnership brokers. And I would say 75 to 80% of the people who take our course uh, in Canada anyways are women. So how do we advance this uh, with, with men who tend not to be as interested? And um, so just put that out there. Thank you very much. The last question here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Naila Sanyur. I work here at ITD PM. Uh, I want to build on the point of Jocelyn. And I want to ask you uh, both, Lida and Bulbul, how do we become better broker of partnerships? Is it just a matter of common sense and being nice with people and knowing how to hold a room? There are methodologies and also how, Jocelyn, in your experience, how do you train to become better? I, we have more hands. One more? Okay, go on. I'm not going to answer everything. I'll just do my best to pull out some thoughts. 
Let's give the floor to people that will answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask um, if you have any advice on how to balance the relationships when you do a partnership, because most of the time there is a power imbalance relationship. The donor, and in, in my case, I work for NGOs and foundations and grassroots organizations. And uh, when you work in this kind of field, partnerships don't look like your beautiful book. <laughs> they never look like that. They always look actually quite the opposite. It's like, um, if we are working um, in a, uh, to solve some problem, they will come with their own agenda and they will tell us what do we need to do, right? And at the end of the day, there are the donors and they're the ones that have the power and they can mm, influence a lot of, on, on us and in our work, but we can never change theirs. You know, you, we ne never can change any of the UN nations agency agenda. We can never change any of the government um, development agency that are giving us money. And um, I was working once in a project that we needed to work with um, violence because there was a big cases of violence and women's being killed in Mexico. And then these agencies came and told us, yeah, but you also need to work with a, 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 some kind of like, uh, sexual diseases and we were like we don't really need it but you have to then we change it on the paper right <laughs> so that's how do we balance these kind of relationships in real life every every day when we are working with grassroots organizations because they have the power and uh, it, in those moments there is no um, individual relationships or anything it's just the power of money so how do we balance that? If you have any kind of advice on that, please. Well, I, Thank you. Can I just respond immediately on that? I mean, I, I think that the book does not say partnerships are beautiful at all. It says quite the reverse, that they're very difficult. They're very messy. And I'm always reminded, in fact, in a lot of my classes, I remember, and, and Roz may men remember this too, a colleague who actually began his presentation by saying, if you can find another of way of working, then do it the, another way in order to achieve your goals, because it is difficult to collaborate. So I'm under no illusions about positioning partnership as something wonderful and nice and sugar-coated, not at all. And I think that the problem of donors as partners is one that has been much commented on, um, are donors partners actually or are they something else you know it, it, they, do they sit around the table in the same way as others how do we educate and work with donors there's, there's a lot of literature looking at this and in the practice for example in the work we do with the partnership brokers association the idea is to create that what pertains to the partnership there is some kind of level playing field so that different partners are valued in an equitable manner and the resources that they bring including what donors bring should be equitably valued but it's very very difficult. This is where context does come into play in a world that values the kind of high profile donor and sees money as, as the most important thing. It's very difficult to integrate that. So there are methodologies, contextual methodologies, but I, I think you've touched on a very important issue, which is this donor partner issue that is about power. And I do try and look at it a little bit in the chapter on, on participation participation and power and what who donors are as stakeholders as I said I think they're in very different relationship to a partnership than a small NGO or a community organization etc I'm not going to respond to all the questions I just can't maybe others would like to sorry Cecilia <laughs> uh, I there are a few I'd like to respond to um let me see. I think, uh, Teresa and Valentina, to a certain extent, you were looking at something quite similar, which is this idea, of, we call it in, in European Commission speak, mainstreaming. And it's this idea that the work that you do is institutionalized as you're working and that you've got your, the end is kind of in view, so that w the, um, the kind of practice of partnership becomes how you work. Okay. So it, it means that the partnership, a, a colleague of mine who's been a very important influence on my thinking, Ken Kaplan, always says partnership is a transitional mechanism until what we're practicing is, is kind of part and parcel of what we do and how we work. And then we don't need it anymore because it is so difficult and problematic. So that would be a way of looking at it. I think, I don't know if I'm quite right, but it kind of tallies with what 
some of the implications of what both yourself and Valentina was saying. Valentina, I don't know if I'm answering it well enough, but I'm going to let others, if they want to address that question that you raised um, in more detail further. Uh, Jocelyn, the women and gender thing, uh, I, yes, I'm, I, I agree with you. And in fact, years ago in the, partner, in the partnering initiative, Ros, if you remember, we looked at the possibility of exploring this further because we noticed that the majority of partnership brokers and people coming forward for training were women. And we wondered why, and then wondered if this had something to do with gender. Clearly there's something there, but I work with some amazing men who are also um, incredibly committed to the idea of collaboration. And I guess it's ensuring that, that uh, we're all brought into this. It's again about what Aurelio said, this human connection and contact that becomes the essence of collaboration and somehow we have to reach out and, and connect and make these transversal connections more. But the, there is obviously some research or something to be done around that aspect. Um, Ros, I wanted to come back. Ros is very dear to me. In fact, I wouldn't be working in partnerships if it hadn't been for Ros, because I met her, as she says, right at the beginning of my journey on, on partnerships. And we worked together very closely for many years. And she's absolutely right. I am, I am an activist at heart and, and always have been. And that hasn't gone away. And what I do try and do in the book is uh, talk about transformation as being messy and difficult. And it hurts. And that we have to acknowledge that we can't kind of um, cushion it and, and uh, pat it down into something that we can manage. So um, I think you'll be surprised to see those ideas are still there, perhaps, and I'm, they will not ever go away, hopefully. Uh, and then Naila, your, your question about um, how we can be better brokers, go to the Partnership Brokers Association. They have huge, um, done a lot of work on this. And what they will always say is that every partnership broker is different, that we've all probably got those capabilities in us. And it's a matter of drawing on yourself, which goes back to this idea of the individual and finding and touching the right points. There are, there are partnership brokers in the room, including Paloma and Carlos have worked in this, but the partnership broker Brokers Association has some really rich information and material on, on how you can work better as a, as a partnership broker, which I strongly suggest that you look at. Great, great. Bulbo, do you want to have a last words for us? Do you have your hand uh, on? Just, just 30 seconds in response to Ross's question and, so, and the power imbalance issues that are being raised. I think uh, Leader's book has a whole chapter on transformative participation, where she talks about the role of conflict and disruption. And, uh, and there's no way to change the power imbalance without disrupting it. And that is one of the roles of partnership brokers. Uh, how, how do we do that? And hopefully there'll be more on that and on other books in the series, David. Yeah. We have to close uh, here. Uh, thank you, Volvo, uh, David, uh, Lida. Thank you to, to all of you that are following this session from different uh, places, countries. Uh, I think we have here a mix of uh, change uh, makers and enablers. Uh, that is uh, something necessary for, for this to work. And I, I hope, uh, Lida, that this uh, space, this hybrid space, has something of brave space. Not only it is safe, but I, I love this uh, uh, distinction that you, that you, that you made. It's Bulbous. <laughs> Great. It's, it's yours. It's uh, David uh, Shapiro's. <laughs> we, <we're> not, anyway. <laughs> it's David Shapiro's uh, coinage. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you for this uh, gift. Uh, we need, uh, 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 appropriate words are, are a gift for <laughs> all, all of us that are working in this field in which we need a language sometimes to, to express what we are experimenting. And well, in one hour and a half, we have had uh, the, um, uh, the, the condense of uh, more than 30 years of uh, experience, of practicing, of fighting, of suffering, of enjoying, but uh, above all, of sharing with uh, so many people and uh, an organization. It has been a luxury uh, for, for we all. And uh, I think we all are keen on having that, that book and, and uh, uh, go deeper in, in uh, the, the, the pages. And perhaps we will have another opportunity to, once we have read the book, to, to, to have he, uh, here again the Lida 
or perhaps we can go to Cambria or to India. The next uh, uh, meeting has to be in one of the other places. Very welcome. You're very welcome, Carlos. Thank you, David. Very welcome. You thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks again, and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye.